Last week we looked at how to handle hurt and the fact that people are hurting. And we looked at that whole aspect of the fact that people hurt. And yet we've got verses in the Bible, and I've mentioned that Jesus said, I've overcome, I've, that it is finished. And we read things in the Bible and, and it kind of, it's hard to put the two together. Because on the one hand, Jesus has defeated the devil. And yet on the other hand, the devil is real and, has a, and is having an impact on our lives. On the one side, he's brought healing to us all. But on the other side, people are sick. You know, there's people that are suffering certain stuff and yet Jesus has the answer for that. And it's too easy to point out and say things that are quite negative and say, well, it's because of this or because of that. You see, some things we go through, believe it or not, it's not all from the devil. Some stuff's from ourselves. But some stuff is also God pruning us down. Not everything is from the devil. Not everything is out. To have a go. There's a verse in Romans 8, 28. It says this, that for we know that God works out for the good of all those that love him. I think that's a quick paraphrase of it. And it, but it starts off with, for we know. But if we don't know, then we can't trust in that. Now, not everything that happens to us is good. There's bad things happen to good people. But what we can trust in is the fact that we know the God that we know will change that circumstance around for his glory and for our good. That God will always change things around for us. For those, it says, who love him. Not for those who pretend. Not for those who just are in church or those who just do nice things. It says for those who love him. For those who put the trust in him. For those that will lay their life down him. For even prophecy says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And yet often we say we trust God, but we're going to work it out ourselves. And the kind of the two things don't always go together. But God's plan for us is not always worked out in our intellect. And I think sometimes as Christians we suffer from the fact of overthinking things instead of overfaithing things. We try to work it out for ourselves instead of going, you know, God, I'm going to trust in you and I'm going to trust in you. <coughs> and when it turns around and it's all going pear-shaped, we still say, I'm going to trust in you. And when it goes flat on its face, I'm still going to trust in you. Because I've realised the worst thing that can happen to me is I die. I die. But in reality, that's not really a bad thing. Because it's just a start of a new thing. So everything between now and then, I've just got to tolerate, put up with, whack, march through, and become an awesome believer of God. You see, I've always had this problem that there's, there's different groups of people, and, and people say lots of things, and I'm, you know, we've, we've all got different ideas, but sometimes the Bible says one thing, and yet we see something else. And we've got to trust in what the Bible says. You see, there's people saying Jesus has done it all on the cross. And yes, he has. Jesus has done everything we need on the cross. It's all done. It's paid for. But how many know that we've still got to walk through things? We can't sit back and be passive. There's Christians saying Jesus has done it all. Therefore, I can sit back and do absolutely nothing. There's even people that are saying Jesus has done it all so I can do whatever I want. That's not even true. Well, they think it is, and they're doing that. That's not true. <laughs> How many of you know that what Peter says, add to your faith, and he lists a load of things. Peter says, you add to your faith. He doesn't say, God will add to your faith. So if Peter says, you do, you add to your faith, that means you produce without it. Paul says, we need to walk in patience. That means we've got to choose to be patient. We can't say, God... I'll be patient in you and then lose a drag. We've got to say, no, I choose to be patient in this situation. Yeah. Yet we think, Jesus has done it all. Well, he has. He's done it all. But we're still going to walk that out in our lives. We can't be passive about everything and anything. We've got to trust. Now, trusting God does not mean being totally passive. It means trusting him and engaging in prayer and in the word of God. It means we grow as people. You see, the Bible says that we know all things, but unless you start reading, you'll never know all things. The Holy Spirit's inside you wanting to release great things into your life, but unless you're engaging in the Word of God, you're never going to get past the beginning stages of things. God is awesome and amazing, and He's done everything we need for salvation. And if He never did another thing for us, that would be enough that He did. 
He's done it all. But between now and the day he either comes or we die, we've got to walk the good walk of faith. We've got to walk worthy, it says in Ephesians. In fact, in Ephesians 2, it says this, the great verse that we all know, for it is not by, it is by faith you have been saved. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not a gift of you, it's a gift from God. That we should not boast. But the next verse beyond that says that we were saved for good works. That will bring glory to God. You see, we weren't saved to sit and do nothing. We were saved to do good works. We, weren't, we don't do good works to get saved. Did you hear me say that? You don't do things to get saved, but when you're saved, you do good works. You see, I'm very conscious, as many people say, and, and as I, I'm walking around bumping into people saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But you look at the life and you think, if that's a Christian life, then I don't really, something's missing. Because the Bible talks about show fruits of repentance. When you say it, you'll produce good fruit. You'll produce amazing fruit. When you are saved, you are saved to do good works. Not bad works, good works. You know, a tree that's planted, I was going to bring some fruit in this morning, but I'm not quite sure what God was going to do. But I'm going to go, what tree did this grow upon? And hold an apple up. And everybody go, an apple tree. Because it's obvious. And, a, and an orange, you say an orange tree. And then I'm going to bring a peanut and see if anyone notices that peanut's growing the ground. Just to be funny. But Christians should produce fruit in keeping with what God is doing in our life. And that fruit should increase and grow and get better time on time. You see, it's okay to be saved for 10 years and still be just growing. But if you've been saved 20 years and you're still a baby, there's big question marks about it. Because that's abnormal. There are some people, grown men, that like to pretend they're babies, and I think there's, some, there's an issue there. <laughs> you might have seen some. Yeah. There's an issue because we grow up. If our children stayed as babies, as cute as that is, there's something wrong. If we stop learning, there's something wrong. And God has saved us to do awesome things. Right, okay, back into... I'm going to get into I'm going to be reading from the um, New American Standard Version. I'm just going to read a few verses from John 15. And this is all off the top of my head, so... We'll see how we go. Verse 1, it says, I am the vine. This is Jesus speaking. So Jesus said, I am the vine. And my father is the vine, the vine dresser or the gardener. It's interesting that Claire brought a word out about the, you know, the, the garden and, so, and then what Ruth brought and what Louisa brought. These are all tied in. And I think this is really good. But it says, I am the vine, my father is the gardener. Okay, so you need to get this in, in perspective. God the Father is the gardener. The gardener is the one with the scissors. Okay, well, I'm just giving you an heads up what's coming. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may produce more fruit. So back to verse 2, it says, Every branch, get this, in me. Every branch, Jesus says, that's in me, that does not produce fruit, is cut off and burnt. I only saw that the other day. Every branch in me, and I've gone through nearly 20 translations, and they all say, every branch in me. So a branch that's in Jesus that doesn't produce fruit in keeping with repentance, it's cut off, and it actually says it's taken away and burnt. Look at that if you want. You know what I mean? People often say to me, Johnny, you don't understand that God's love is God's love, and God will never take away his love from me. And they say that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And I say, yeah, you're right. I preach that. And I love Romans 8. It's amazing. But how many of you know that God loved you before you were a Christian? So he's not going to change his love after you're a Christian. So using that to say, I'm okay, Jack. I can live like I want. I can do what I want. Because God's love will never, nothing will ever separate me from the love of God. It's kind of a misnomer. Because he loved you before you were a Christian. 
I think that's amazing that he loved me before I were a Christian and he still loves me when he's got to know me. He already knew me, but I'm thinking, you know, it must be an amazing God. So anyway, I actually do believe that, you know, we are securing God. I will say that. But every branch in me that does not produce or does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. Guys, some of you guys think you're going through an hard time and it's not of your making. It's not you who's done it. You're not <coughs> messed up. You're not doing anything stupid. But something in your life just feels like it's been, it's been chopped away. Maybe God's pruning you. Maybe it's just trimming some things back because you've got some greater things. Yeah. Now, yeah. My, somebody once asked me many years ago to prune their tree. It was a fruit tree. And I totally butchered it. Because when I prune something, I prune it. It got from this huge big tree to a shrub. They were devastated. And oh, I'm going to wrap them, I'm going to sue me and all sorts. And I said, I'll tell you what, don't pay a penny. But in two years' time, I'll come back and see you. And if it's producing more fruit than it did before, you can give me my invoice plus 50%. <laughs> well, I'm going to get paid for a year and a half. I'll be cheeky. So I went, yeah, okay. So I went off. A year and a half later, I turned up. <laughs> I wanted my money. <laughs> and they were gobsmacked to that because I pruned it correctly. I didn't butcher it, butcher it like they thought. I trimmed it back properly. I knew where to trim things back and a way to cut things. I were a gardener. But it grew more fruit. See, God wants in our lives. Sometimes he trims people away from you because they're toxic. They're hurtful. Some people he can't get away from. Now, if it's your spouse, you can't get rid of them. You chose them, you can sit with them. Make the best of it. You know, if it's your kids, you can't just fob them off. <laughs> You've got responsibility. Yeah. But sometimes God prunes us back. Not because we've done something wrong. Please don't think God's pruning me back because I've sinned. Sometimes it's nothing to do with that. It's because God sees an awesome potential in you. And that potential means I've got to trim you back a little bit. We've got a little tree in our garden. We've grown it since it was seed. Hope planted it. It's about this big. It's about eight years old. But the reason it's this big is because A, it wasn't a plant pot for many years. And it's been knocked around, chopped and broken. But it's still growing into it. But it's a golden delicious Apple seeds with plants. And we're not even sure if they grow in this country because they're from France and, and Spain. But we try to grow this plant. But every now and then we chop the little branch off that spout out of the bottom. Because we don't want it growing out at the bottom, we want it growing up. But sometimes we've got to put a stick next to it in the early days to make it solid. You know, the Word of God is a stick in your life that will keep you solid on things. You see, most plants want to grow and want to fall over and do all sorts of things. But the word of God, the trueness of the word of God, in any fruit, this is talking about a vine. And it's talking about the fact that vines need sticks to grow against. Otherwise just lay up floor. And if a vine's on the floor and it produces fruit, it's rotten fruit. But when it's got something to stand next to, to hold on to. And Jesus says that he is the vine, we are the branches. We're the, just the branches. Without him, we can do nothing, it says. I'm the better read on, I'm jumping ahead. It says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken over you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit in itself unless it abides in the vine. And so neither can you unless you abide in me. I love that because all the fruit that comes out in my life is not because of me. It's because I'm attached to him. So anything good that comes out of my life is not because I'm a good person and I'm definitely not a nice person, but it's because I'm attached to Jesus. <coughs> so all that love and joy and patience and kindness and goodness that flows sometimes out of my life, sometimes I said, it's all coming from him. Yeah. Sometimes I put a rubber band on it, I don't want some stuff to come out of my life. And, said, and then Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, if we stay in him and in the word of God, we will produce much fruit. Not just a little bit of fruit. See, this verse on the wall, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We love that verse. Kind of out of context sometimes. But Jesus has said here that without him, we can do nothing. But in him, we can do all things. You see the difference? 
So you can struggle through life getting on and doing your own thing. Or you can say, I need to be planted deep into Jesus. And then you know, in him I can do all things, but without him I can do nothing. You see, the only reason that some of us are still alive is because we're Christians. Some of us are still here and still ticking on is because God's got a blessing on our life. I am abide, you are the branches. If Jesus continues, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away <coughs> as a branch and tied up. And, he will be, and they will be gathered and cast into the fire and they will be burnt. So he said, if anyone does not abide in me, if we do not stay in him, then we're like a branch that's just picked up, cast away. And then he says, if you abide in me, I love the word if, because it's a choice. It's a choice. If, one way or the other, take a choice. Speed or don't speed, do whatever. If, if you abide in me, and my word, important thing here, if you stay in me, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. So he's taking it to the next step now. And my word <coughs> abides in you, <coughs> ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So he started saying, and then you be able to, if you abide in me and my word stays in you, you'll be able to get into some awesome prayer. You'll be able to really engage in prayer. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so proves to be my disciple. See, God is glorified in you when you produce fruit. God gets excited when you produce fruit. He gets really excited. In fact, in, in, in Songs of Song, he said he sings over you. He dances around you. Imagine God doing that. That's what he said he does. Because he looks at you and thinks you're amazing. And he's talking, take it to the verse. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. So God glorified when we produce fruit. When you're honouring God and producing fruit, you're glorifying God. You want to glorify God? We say it this morning. You know, glorify your name in all the earth. Glorify God by producing great fruit. That's just a, And then it says this, and so, back to what I said originally, and so prove that you are my disciples. So prove you are my disciple. By bearing fruit, you prove you're a disciple. <coughs> We got a letter from somebody, uh, somebody that you know, so I won't mention his name, but we got a letter from him, uh, Phil and I, it's addressed to a couple of people, and he's confessed to being a Christian, but his life is a total mess, and now he's, he's, a, he's on holiday at Her Majesty's Service in Armley, and he's saying I'm a Christian, but he's done things totally messing up, knowing what's right, but choosing to do what's wrong. Knowing what's right, he's not proving he's a Christian, he's proving he's got a long way to go if he is a Christian. He's proving that God wants to do some work in him, but he's not allowing it. John 8, I'll read it. John 8, talk about the Word of God. <coughs> I just don't want to spoil it if I pray for it. John 8 verse 31 says this. But to the Jew, also to the Jews who had believed in him, so Jesus is speaking to a group of people that believe in Jesus. For believing who he is and believing he's doing amazing things. And he said, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, has anybody got the King, New King James Version Bible? And it's in John 8. Ruth, what does it say, verse uh, 31? Because the NIV is not brilliant on this one. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples yeah. indeed. If you abide, if you stay in my word. <laughs> you see, it's good for us to take over and you know, move from one year to another. But I want to encourage you at the start of this year to get into the word of God. You see, Jesus says, He is a vine, we are the branches. The Father's one who trims us back and cuts off the dead wood. But then he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll be able to pray some pretty amazing prayers. But in this one, Jesus says, to those that believed in him, he says, if you hold on to my teachings, but if, he said, if you abide in my words, then you are really my disciples. You see, the fruit of your life should demonstrate that you are a disciple of God. 
a disciple of Jesus. Guys, I need you to shape up, shape up and to actually start being conscious of the fact that we have a part to play in our walk with God. Read Ephesians and it talks a lot about that we are predestined, that we are sealed, that we've got all these great, awesome blessings. And then when it's told you how amazing you are in Christ, it says, now walk the good walk. <laughs> well, how can you walk the walk? You've got to walk the walk. And then as you walk the walk, you listen to what Jesus says, you read his word, his words abide in you, and then you are his disciples. But verse 32 says, then... So you need to tie in, if you hold to my teachings, you are my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. A lot of us, it's not the fact that you don't have faith, it's just that you don't know the truth. And the truth is, Jesus did everything on the cross. The problem is that we're made up, and I was, I was going to preach this, but God led me down a different way. We're made up of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Our spirit is saved, <coughs> sanctified, it's, it's, it's sealed. And our body is still our body. And in between is our mind, our soul. And there's a battlefield going on between, and Ruth's going to speak about in a couple of weeks, about the whole mind thing. But the Bible says, <coughs> you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You see, it's all right saying, I know that, but if you don't know it in your heart, it's not going to change it. And there's people I go up to and say, this is what the Bible said. And they'll go, I know. I know. And I'm looking at them going, they do not know. Because if they knew, they'd change something on the outside. Because what happens on the heart comes out on the outside. Out of the overflow of the mouth, the heart, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever comes out of your God... That's mouth to those listening on the internet. The orchard turn up. Whatever comes out of your mouth is what's really going on inside you. We can put a mask on. We put, can pretend. Oh, I'm a nice Christian. Man. I'm doing all right. But we have no fruit to back that up. We have no proof to show that. And our mouth spews out rubbish. Now, obviously, I'm not talking to anybody here. Or maybe. I'm trying to challenge you not to sit back and think we're all right. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. Some say he could come back this year. He could. But it could be another 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. And we haven't got time to chill out for the next 40 years doing nothing. Hoping he's going to come back today. We've got a job to do. We were born again to produce fruit and to do good works. Not to sit back and think we've got it all sorted. We need to be teachable. We need to have hearts that are hungry for God. We need to allow him to be the gardener that trims back things in our life that is not good. I'm going to be honest with you guys, if you've nobody can speak into your life and bring a verse or bring a truth into your life, you're in a sad case. Because God puts us in a body of believers so people can speak into each other's lives. And sometimes what people speak into our lives, it hurts. Because it's truth. And that's like the gardener just trimming us a little bit. So like that, but if nobody can, then you're a plant laid at the side of the road who's going to produce fruit on the road that's going to be just mangled. God wants us to trim ourselves with the word, stand, sorry, in the word of God, standing tall, allowing the Father to trim us. Connected into the good vine, producing good fruit. That's going to not only be a blessing to us, it's going to be a blessing. Do you know the fruit you produce is not really for you? You don't see grapes producing grapes going, they're for me. <laughs> they're a blessing to others. Guys, when somebody shows you patience, that's a blessing to you. <laughs> it's not that they don't want to show patience sometimes. I'm sorry, I just looked at Ruth there. She's got this baby. I think her patience is <laughs> gross. But Ruth produces something. Or something's growing on the inside of it and it'll get uncomfortable. I'm not speaking negativity, but you know. It, it's a case of it gets uncomfortable. It gets awkward. There's pain sometimes. And then you go all through that pleasant rose garden of giving birth. Andy, they go, oh. <laughs> but it produces a fruit which is amazing. In your life, some people think that you're going through rubbish and trouble because the devil's having a go at you. And God's going, no, I'm trying to produce something good in your life. 
I'm trying to bring a standard alongside you and that's restricting you a little bit and I'm trimming things back off just so you grow awesome fruit in your life. Now this last year has gone, it, God turns everything around for his good if we allow him. But last year might have been a good year, a bad year. God's not tied up by January the 1st, but he wants to produce amazing stuff in all our lives, good stuff. That's going to be a blessing to people. And I know I've not got there yet. I'm still trying to push ahead, trying to grow. I don't always produce in the right places, but I'm just going to trust God. And I know it's not a song and a dance, and I know it's not easy. But sometimes we've just got to say, God, I'm going to trust in you. Let me produce fruit. That's a blessing to you, God. But I don't become a branch that you cut off and throw into the fire. That I'm not that person who pretends to be. I want to know the truth. And I want that truth, the word of God, to abide in me so that it sets me free. So when sickness comes, I can know the truth that Jesus died on the cross, giving me healing. So I'm already healed, so I've got to fight the battle knowing that I've already got it. When poverty and destruction comes, I can stand on that ground and say, God, you died so I could be blessed and be a blessing. You took away that addiction. You dealt with that anxiety. You dealt with that problem and situation on the cross. I'm going to stand with you. When Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, he meant it is finished. But how many know that when, most historians reckon that when Germany got defeated at Stalingrad in 1944, I think it was, or 1943, they're going to Russia and Russians had coaxed them in, coaxed them in, and the Russians surrounded them, I think it was 44, the Brits and the Americans were coming in over to France. That was the end of the war. But it took nearly a year for Germany to realise they'd lost the war and surrender. But the historians say at that point the war was already lost to Germany, won by the Allies. But how many know that people still died? People still had to fight. Guys, Jesus had won the war, but we're still in a battle. We still have to put on the armour of God. We've still got to take our stand. We can't just sit back and say, it's up to you, God. What will be, will be. There's no such thing in the Bible as what will be, will be. We stand and fall by the words of our own mouth. And what we believe and stand on. So I'm trying to be encouraging. I'm trying to encourage you. If there is trouble, if there's not trouble, if there is a situation where you feel uncomfortable, it could just be God lining you up with the word of God. I'm encouraging everybody to read Proverbs. I, you know, I'm encouraging you, please read Proverbs. But if, if you can read Proverbs without getting a slap in the face, yeah. you're not reading Proverbs. Yeah. Because it's so... I mean, try and get into chapter 4 without sort of yeah. slapping you. That's God just lining you back up with his word. And allowing his word to abide in you. In Psalm 1, he talks about a tree planted by streams of water. That no matter what's happening, whatever the weather like, it will produce good fruit. It's the same analogy of being in the vine. It's the same analogy of being alongside a stream. It's the same analogy of saying, I'm just spending time in God. These are all different ideas, but the same thing, that God wants you to produce amazing fruit in your life. Amen. Amen. I'm going to show up now. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you are the gardener. Lord, I thank you that as we abide in Jesus, that you will sometimes trim us back. Lord, you'll trim us down a little bit. Lord, I thank you that often it just stops pride growing. It stops us thinking we're more than what we are. Lord, help us to, to abide in you. It's our choice to abide in you, Lord. Help us to abide in you, to stand in you, Lord. Lord, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. Knowing that there's nothing can separate us from you, Lord. That you've already made a way for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love us so much. Care for us so much. But Lord, you don't tolerate sin. 
You don't tolerate stupid things. But you make a way for us to deal with them. To cleanse ourselves and to step forward in you, Lord. Washing us, Lord, with the word of God. So we can stand before you as a radiant bride. Lord, I thank you for all that you do and the great fruit that you're producing in all our lives. Mm -hmm. And Lord, give you permission for me and for my family, Lord, and for this church, Lord, that if you need to trim us to produce more fruit, Lord, I, pray, I give it over to you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.